on the table. The unfinished business is a vote on the motion of the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Bacchus, to suspend the rules and pass H.R. 360, on which the yeas and nays are ordered. And the clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 360, a bill to award posthumously a congressional gold medal to Addie Mae Collins, Denise McNair, Carol Robinson, and Cynthia Wesley to commemorate the lives they lost 50 years ago in the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church where these four little black girls ultimate sacrifice served as a catalyst for the civil rights movement. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass a bill as amended? Members will record their vote by electronic device and this will be a five minute vote. A five minute vote. The bombing at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama happened on September 15, 1963. This is a bill that would award posthumously the Congressional Gold Medal to Addie Mae Collins, Denise McNair, Carol Robertson, and Cynthia Wesley, killed in that bombing 50 years ago. This is the last vote in this series. We expect the House to move on to a general debate on the uh, pre-existing conditions bill. Party line vote passes the rule 225 to 189. There will be an hour of general debate and two amendments.
On this vote, the yeas are 420, the nays are zero. Two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended, the bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. As a gentlelady from Madam Speaker, Florida. I ask unanimous consent that it may be in order at any time on Wednesday, May 8, 2013, for the Speaker to declare a recess subject to the call of the Chair for the purpose of receiving in joint meeting Her Excellency Pat Kwon Yee, President of the Republic of Korea. Without objection. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Alabama ask for permission for one minute? The gentlelady is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Today I just want to thank this body for passing uh, this profound congressional gold medal in honor of the four little girls who lost their lives in the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church. We're so honored today to have members. Gentlemen's correct. The House is not in order. The House will be in order and members will take their conversations off the floor. Madam Speaker, I just want to acknowledge uh, my sincere appreciation to the leadership of both parties in getting this Congressional Gold Medal on the floor. Uh, we have in our presence uh, two uh, sisters of two of the deceased uh, four little girls, and I am just, I think I speak on behalf of the whole state of Alabama and our Alabama delegation when I say a profound thank you for this body. And I know that everyone here uh, is mighty appreciative of the sacrifices that their families have have made in order for our great nation to live up to its true ideals of justice and equality for all. And I think that it's befitting if we all stand and clap. A unanimous vote is truly uh, a, a victory for all of us, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank Gen you. Gentlelady yields back. For what purposes does the gentlelady from Florida seek recognition? I ask unanimous consent to uh, address the House for one minute and revise and extend my remarks. And the gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The case for tax reform was never made more clear when Americans recently struggled to fill out their increasingly complicated income tax forms. What we really need now is Tax Code Liberation Day. Our convoluted tax code has become a major obstacle to individual freedom, which must be removed as soon as possible. It prevents small businesses from hiring more workers in what is now a nearly dead economic recovery. The burden of preparing your taxes is now nearly as onerous as actually paying for the taxes. It takes 13 hours for the average American to prepare his or her taxes. The tax code remains almost four million words, many of which are incomprehensible. We must all work together to free small businesses and individuals of the most complex regulation of them all, the Federal Income Tax Code. Thank you, Madam Speaker. For what purpose does the gentleman from Ohio seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I rise today along with several of my pro-life colleagues to bring attention to the ongoing trial of Kermit Gosnell, an abortionist from Philadelphia. Gosnell is accused of murdering in the third degree a woman who died during an abortion at his clinic and first degree murder of four infants who survived abortions and were born alive only to have their spinal cord severed by a pair of scissors. In his words, in the words of the grand jury report, Gosnell had a simple solution for unwanted babies. He killed them. He didn't call it that. He called it ensuring fetal demise. I'm horrified by the lack of respect this doctor has for human life. And I'm appalled by the minimal media coverage of the Gosnell trial. I'm hopeful that the disturbing images 
The images revealed by this trial will raise awareness of the gruesome practices of the abortion industry and help to prevent the tragic ending of human life that occurs every day at abortion clinics across this country. And with that, I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from West Virginia seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in strong support of the Helping Sick Americans Act. I co-sponsored this legislation because it addresses something that is particularly important to Republicans and Democrats alike, providing care for those who need it most. I strongly supported, I strongly opposed Obamacare and have supported the efforts to repeal it. However, it's the law of the land. In it, the President and Congress made a promise to help Americans with pre-existing conditions. The President has broken this promise when he consciously cut off access to the program dealing with pre-existing conditions and left tens of thousands of Americans with nowhere to turn for their health care. To many Americans, this is typical of Washington, empty gestures and broken promises. This has to stop. We have a chance to help people get the care they were promised by taking money from a wasteful slush fund. I intend to uphold the president once promise he once made and now is broken. I urge my colleagues to do the same and vote for the common sense legislation. I yield back my time. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Texas seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The House will begin discussing in the next day the legislation called Helping Sick Americans Now Act, and it only offer a counter to that, that it seems a sick way to try and help those who are in need. This bill will deplete the healthy preventative care funding that impacts the Centers for Disease Control, that impacts the federally qualified health clinics that are all throughout our community, and it only provides funding for the most sickest of Americans up until December 2013. Why don't we encourage the governors, like Governor Perry of Texas, to accept expanded Medicaid to help heal six million and provide health care for six million uninsured in Texas, the highest number of uninsured in any state. This is a temporary fix that is not necessary. We have the Affordable Care Act that is being implemented, and as we speak, millions of Americans are being covered. This is the wrong way, misdirected, and I might say it is a sick way of trying to help the sickest of Americans. I oppose the bill and yield back. The gentlelady's time has expired. The chair lays before the House the following message. To the Congress of the United States, I am pleased to transmit the 2013 National Drug Control Strategy, my administration's blueprint for reducing drug use and its consequences in the United States. As detailed in the pages that follow, my administration remains committed to a balanced public health and public safety approach to drug policy. This approach is based on science, not ideology, and scientific research suggests that we have made real progress. The rate of current cocaine use in the United States has dropped by 50 percent since 2006, and methamphetamine use has declined by one-third. New data released this year suggests that we are turning a corner in our efforts to address the epidemic of prescription drug use, with the number of people abusing prescription drugs decreasing by nearly 13 percent from 7 million in 2010 to 6.1 million in 2011. And the number of Americans reporting that they drove after using illicit drugs also dropped by 12 percent between 2010 and 2011. While this progress is encouraging, we must sustain our commitment to preventing drug use before it starts, the most cost-effective way to address the drug problem. The importance of prevention is becoming ever more apparent.
Despite positive trends in other areas, we continue to see elevated rates of marijuana use among young people, likely driven by declines in perceptions of risk. We must continue to get the facts out about the health risks of drug use and support the positive influences in young people's lives that help them avoid risky behaviors. The strategy that follows presents a sophisticated approach to a complicated problem encompassing prevention, early intervention, treatment, recovery support, criminal justice reform, effective law enforcement, and international cooperation. I look forward to working with the Congress and stakeholders at all levels in advancing this 21st century approach to drug policy. Signed, Barack Obama, the White House. Referred to the Committees on Energy and Commerce, Education and the Workforce, Veterans Affairs, Armed Services, the Judiciary, Natural Resources, Financial Services, Homeland Security, Oversight and Government Reform, Ways and Means, Foreign Affairs, Transportation and Infrastructure, and Intelligence, and Ordered Printed. For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan seek recognition? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute, revise and extend my remarks. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you. I, I wanted to begin our discussion with H.R. 1549, which will be up tomorrow, Helping Sick Americans Now Act. Uh, I am not supporting this bill because the bill's proposals are counterintuitive to the anticipated outcome of the Prevention and Public Health Fund. This legislation strips four years of funding from the Prevention Fund to pay for a very short extension of a new enrollment in the pre-existing condition insurance plan. Uh, further, the bill insists on a partisan offset that effectively eliminates the Prevention and Public Health Fund through 2016 to instead reopen the federal high-risk pool program created by the Affordable Care Act through the end of the year. While I support reopening the high-risk pool, I cannot support how this bill goes about creating the funding. I uh, yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair lays before the House the following personal requests. Leaves of absence requested for Mr. Cook of California for today and Mr. Flores of Texas for today and for the balance of the week. Without objection, the requests are granted. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 3rd, 2013, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the majority leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's, uh, it's good to be in the People's House this afternoon to talk about a topic that is uh, of utmost concern to the American people, energy. Uh, before I start, that conversation, though, I ask Mr. Speaker for unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material on the subject of my special order. Without objection, so ordered. Energy. What does it mean for America? We all put gas in our cars. We all heat and cool our homes, businesses across this country power their manufacturing processes. So what does energy mean for today and for the future of our country? I'm proud to be a member of the House Energy Action Team because we understand the critical role that domestic energy production plays not only today, but in the future of our country. And let me, 
Let me give an example about why this is so important. I remember one of the, the very first memorable events that occurred in March of 2011 in my first term. We were addressed here in this chamber by the Prime Minister of Australia. And in her remarks, she commented. She said, I remember being a young girl sitting on the floor of my living room watching Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin land on the moon. She went on to talk about how America and Australia had stood side by side, how America had actually stood in front of and protected Australia during some of the darkest days of World War II in the Pacific. At the end of her speech, she said, you know, back when I was a little girl and I saw that moon landing, I thought to myself, wow, those Americans can do anything. And she wrapped up her comments by saying, today, as Prime Minister of Australia, with a lot of experience under my belt, today I still believe that Americans can do anything. And when you stop and think about the moon landing, and I know you're going to say, well, what does that have to do with energy? I'm getting to that. President Kennedy gave us a vision of putting a man on the moon in 10 years. We didn't make it in 10 years. We made it in less than 10 years. And the reason that we did was because every fabric of our society bought into the idea. Academic institutions, the scientific community, Industries cropped up overnight. Millions of jobs were created. Young people lined up to get into academic programs where they could major in degrees that would prepare them for careers in space exploration. And at the end of the day, actually we're not at the end of the day. We're still benefiting from the innovation and the and the technological advance that came out of that era. It was, it was a time when America's imagination was captivated by what many thought was impossible and what the rest of the world didn't really think we could do. But you look at what has happened since we started that journey. All of the technological innovations that have occurred cell phones, flat screen TVs, GPS, uh, even arthroscopic surgery. You know, we had to learn to perform medical procedures on space travelers in a way that was non-invasive, and medical experts began to think about how do we do that in outer space. So we learned how to dream, and that goal to put a man on the moon captivated America's imagination. I want you to think about for a second what would happen if America once again embarked on a journey of that magnitude. And I believe a journey to become energy independent and secure in America is just such a journey that we can embark on. A vision of energy independence and security would not only captivate the imagination of the American people, but it would put America back to work at a time when our economy is in such desperate need of private sector economic growth. Imagine what would happen if we had a national energy vision that sounded something like this. We're going to go after the vast volumes of oil and natural gas that we have. We've got more of it than anyone else in the world does, by many experts' opinion. 
We're going to expand our nuclear footprint because nuclear energy is one of the safest, most reliable forms of energy on the planet. And we brought that to the world. We know how to do it. We're going to continue to mine coal. And we're going to learn how to use it environmentally soundly because we've got enough coal to fuel our energy needs for generations yet to come. And we're even going to embrace alternative forms of energy, biofuels, wind and solar. Now, they're not going to meet our heavy lifting energy needs for the foreseeable future, but there's a role that they play in our overall energy profile. And we're going to back that up with action with the regulatory community. Tell the regulators at the EPA and the Department of the Interior and the Army Corps of Engineers, effective today, you start being partners in progress with America's energy industries. Rather than being the department of no, learn how to find a way forward. If a particular project or a particular technology presents Concerns, then let's address those concerns. But no should not be the final answer. We've learned through the lessons of putting a man on the moon that when Americans are allowed to dream, when they're allowed to innovate, when they're allowed to compete, there's nothing that we can't solve. Why is energy independence and security so important? Well, you know, first of all, it's, it's important because of national security. Right now, today, we, we are beholding to, to some countries that don't like us very much for our energy resources. Why do we want to continue to do that when we have the resources right here at home to be able to solve that problem? But in order to captivate the imagination of the American people, we've got to help the American people understand why this is so important to them. You know, we talk about energy in, in terms of very important projects like the Keystone XL pipeline, who the president himself said that the environmental concerns were over-exaggerated. So let's get the project approved. But we talk about it in technical terms, pipelines, hydraulic fracturing, oil rigs, nuclear reactors, uranium enrichment. What does all that mean to American taxpayers, working Americans that are just struggling day in and day out to make ends meet? Here's what it means. Take a manufacturing process, the manufacturing of cereal, Pop-Tarts, you name it, whatever uh, our children consume today. When energy costs, when domestic energy costs are reduced, those manufacturing costs to produce those goods are also reduced. When the price of diesel fuel goes down, the transportation to transport those goods from the manufacturers to the grocery stores, when those costs go down, those savings are passed on in the cost of the product to the consumers. When working mothers and single moms and, and, and single dads trying to make ends meet, trying to figure out how they're going to put kids through college, how they're going to buy the next pair of tennis shoes. When they're balancing the checkbook and they see that their energy costs to heat and to cool their homes are going down and that they're paying less to fill up their car to go back and forth to work, that translates into economic confidence to do the kinds of things that we were able to do during that remarkable period of putting a man on the moon. Today, 
Today we got a lot of naysayers out there that just simply don't understand how important this is, this idea of energy independence and security to the American people. And they're, and they're trying to frighten the American people. Hydraulic fracturing. My goodness. We've been doing hydraulic fracturing in America for over 60 years. 60 years. Over a million such operations. The former EPA administrator herself acknowledged has not been a single incident where hydraulic fracturing has contaminated the water table. Yet the EPA is working hard to try and insert itself into a process that many, many states are already doing and already doing very well. Take, for example, the state of Ohio, where I come from. I sit, literally, my district sits on top of the Marcellus and the Utica Shale, one of the world's largest reservoirs of oil and natural gas. The state of Ohio has been regulating the oil and gas industry since 1965. We're among one of those states that has done a lot of hydraulic fracturing. And yet again, not one proven instance where that process has contaminated drinking water. And yet you've got those that sit on the sidelines and try to frighten homeowners, try to frighten those people that live in Appalachia, Ohio, that their water is going to be contaminated. It's not. It's a proven process. And just over the last five years, we've developed technology called horizontal hydraulic fracturing, where we can go down a mile and then go out horizontally another mile, sometimes more, and have much more of that vital resource of oil and natural gas flowing to the surface. Resources that are going to move America one step closer to energy independence and security. Mr. Speaker, we've got an opportunity to put America back in charge of our economic destiny and an energy vision that says a real all-of-the-above energy vision for this country is what America needs. At this time, I'd like to yield time to my colleague from Tennessee, Mr. Duncan. South Carolina. South Carolina. Well, there's two, uh, two Duncans in the Congress, and uh, it's easily mistaken. But I'll tell you, folks in South Carolina are concerned about where we are with energy in this country. Uh, energy independence is something that's on the minds of folks back home. You know, I drive a diesel truck, and the gentleman from Ohio was talking about diesel fuel just recently. And... I was at the gas pump recently, uh, the fuel pump, fueling my truck with diesel fuel. And I was paying about $3.85 a gallon. And it dawned on me as I watched the 18-wheelers roll by coming from the pumps where uh, they filled up, that if we were able to really achieve American energy independence and we were able to lower the cost at the pump for America's truckers and uh, all the American families, but I use trucking as an example. If we could truly lower the cost of diesel fuel for America's truckers by just one dollar, if we could produce enough uh, American energy resources to lower diesel fuel from that 3.85 a gallon that I was paying down to 2.85 a gallon, those 18 wheelers that were rolling by, I believe, had 400 gallon diesel tanks. Think about that, America. Think about if that trucker, that trucking company, was able to save per fill up. $400, $400 per fill-up for that 18-wheeler. And think about the number of trucks you pass on America's interstates and highway systems. If we could save that, think about the trickle-down effect that that would have for consumer products. And we're not just talking about um, gasoline and diesel fuel. The American uh, hydrocarbons that are produced, uh, when they're refined, they're refined into a lot of different products. And I would, I would ask the folks to research um, what a barrel of hydrocarbon or fossil fuel uh, oil, when you put that under extreme uh, pressure, 
the heat created, how it separates out, and all the different products that come from a barrel of oil. It's an amazing component that God has given us. And so in South Carolina, we understand that the nation can achieve American energy independence. But we also understand that if we can't have American energy independence, why not an all-American energy strategy, strategy where we work with our neighbors to the north, our largest and best trading partner, the Canadians. Or we work with the, the Mexicans and the folks to the south with a transboundary agreement, allow that area where the boundary between Mexico and the United States is, that we can drill in that area and we have an agreement for revenue sharing on the oil produced there. But let's go back to our neighbors to the north, our largest and best trading partner. Um, the former Speaker of the House from South Carolina, David Wilkins, was ambassador to Canada under the Bush administration. I spent a lot of time with Speaker Wilkins, Ambassador Wilkins, and talked about Canada, and we talked about the oil sands. This was before the Keystone XL pipeline. But let's focus on the Keystone XL pipeline to bring that Canadian oil to American refineries that are sitting there with the capacity to refine that Canadian oil. What I mean by capacity, it's idle capacity. It's capacity that could be utilized to refine American resources or Canadian resources coming down to those refineries, refining that into the products that we enjoy as America. That's why XL, uh, Keystone XL Pipeline is so important. Let's put Americans to work. We hear a lot about job creation and putting Americans to work. Well, this truly would. Mr. Speaker, this uh, Keystone XL Pipeline would put Americans to work in those refineries, refining that oil into all the, the chemicals and uh, gasoline products and everything that we use uh, out of a barrel of hydrocarbons or, or a barrel of oil. Keystone Pipeline is something that should happen in this country. And the, the opponents on the other side say, well, you know, that oil is just going to flow from Canada. It's going to flow through the United States. It's going to go to our refineries. But those contracts have been, uh, have been led, and that oil and, and those gasoline products are going to be used in other markets. It will not do anything to affect the price of the pump here. That's what the other side says. But let me just, a simple economic example, it's supply and demand. And global demand is high right now. And the supply is low. The supply is low for a lot of reasons. OPEC cartel, but uh, other things. Policies, moratoriums, and other things from this administration keeps global supply down. But we can, let's assume that the oil from Canada does flow through the United States, refined at our refineries, and does flow out of this country. So what? That increased supply will meet the increased demand, and uh, in, by meeting that demand, that will drive the price down, not only for Americans, but for everyone across the globe. It's the right thing to do to put Americans to work, work to refine that uh, oil into those products at American refineries. It's true job creation. But while we're on the subject of job creation, Mr. Chairman, and, and the gentleman that's heading, uh, heading up the House Energy Action Team, which is focused on an all-American energy strategy, and American energy independence, while we're talking about job creation, let's talk about my state of South Carolina. We've been excluded in the next five-year plan, the plan that would allow offshore drilling off our coast on the Outer Continental Shelf. Right now, folks, the whole Atlantic Shelf is off limits to our drilling, with the exception of a very proactive state of Virginia, which has been able to include the Virginia's offshore area in the next five-year plan, and we'll see if that comes to fruition. But South Carolina is sitting there saying, and with a lot of the other uh, Atlantic states, you know, we believe we have some resources off our coast. We believe there's natural gas off the coast of South Carolina. Let's allow South Carolina's offshore area to be included in the next five-year plan. What does that mean? Does that mean we're going to rush right out there and, and punch a hole in the earth and start producing? Maybe, maybe not. But what it does mean is it allows that expiration. It allows those energy companies to say, you know what, that area is going to be opened up. We haven't explored out there in 30 years. It was 30-year-old technology when we went out there before. Um, let's go out there with new technology. Let's find out what sort of resources might be off the coast of South Carolina on the outer continental shelf of the Atlantic seaboard. Let's go out there. Let's find out what might be there, and let's start producing that. And you know what happens when we do start producing? I just ask you to drive down to Louisiana, and you get on that Highway 90 from Lafayette, down to New Iberia and on down to Huma and, and, uh, and uh, Thibodeau and those areas. You get on that four-lane highway, uh, Mr. Johnson, and you ride down that highway, and on both sides of that four-lane highway, business after business after business after business after business after business, and I could go on and on. These are businesses that aren't out there actually doing the drilling because 
those lease sales were at ExxonMobil or Halliburton or some of those companies. These are the service companies that are servicing offshore drilling. Think about this for a minute. Think about uh, the guys that are using the, the barges and the offshore uh, uh, boats that carry the, the service boats that are taking the drilling mud and the casing and the piping and the diesel fuel for the generators and the food and the personnel and everything else that goes offshore out to the platform. But then think about that. Their companies onshore, they're running trucks up and down the road that need truck repair. They need body repair. We need uh, pipe welders and pipe fitters and experience it. And like I said, business after business after business there in Louisiana is helping the offshore industry. And South Carolina is sitting there going, well, you know what? If we allowed uh, drilling offshore and we allowed um, this to happen on the outer continental shelf, then maybe those businesses would come to South Carolina. The service boats, the drilling mud, the providers, the onshore um, pipe fitters and pipe welders, and you know what? Those guys have to eat, so they fill up the local restaurants, and they shop at the local Piggly Wigglies, and guess what? They give to United Way, and they give to the local church, and it's a trickle-down economy when you've got people working and you've got people creating businesses and providing income to an economy. When we think about on all American energy independence structure, we need to think about all the jobs that are created through that American energy independence. And it's not just the guys that are doing the offshore drilling. And it's not just the guys that are doing the hydraulic, hydraulic fracturing here. That is a tremendous component, and it's working in Pennsylvania, should be working in southern New York, it's working in Ohio, it's producing resources. And we we talk about energy, we focus a lot right now on North Dakota. North Dakota, my gosh, it's a microcosm of what we could be in this country if we truly pursued an American energy policy. North Dakota, 3% unemployment or less, some say it's a negative unemployment. I say when you get off an airplane in North Dakota, they give you a job whether you need one or not. You talk about uh, a lack of housing. They don't have housing for people coming up there to take the job. If you need a job in America and you're willing to travel to North Dakota, you go up and get $70,000 a year driving a water truck. Jobs are created. North Dakota, a microcosm of what we could be in this country if we truly pursued an American energy policy, an all-American energy policy. And that includes hydraulic fracturing. That includes drilling on federal land that's currently off limits to energy exploration, energy production, but it's also off limits to wind and solar. Federal land that you own, America, the American taxpayers own this federal land, it ought to be utilized to the maximum benefit for American taxpayers. Folks, we can reduce our fuel prices at, at the pump. We can reduce your prices for electricity at home. And that's through American energy policy that's truly all of the above. And so I appreciate the gentleman from Ohio uh, leading this leadership hour, giving me the opportunity to speak about something that I am very passionate about. And that is an all-American energy policy that produces resources here, lessens our dependence on the Middle East, lessens our dependence on the OPEC cartel, truly trades with our neighbors to the north and the south, and approaches true independence. And with that, Ms. Uh, Madam Speaker, I will yield back to the gentleman from Ohio. I thank my colleague for, uh, for yielding back. At this time, I'd like to yield some time to our chairman from Texas, Mr. Smith. Madam Speaker, I thank the gentleman from Ohio for yielding me time. As chairman of the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, I'd like to focus my remarks on the role of science and technology in Republicans' all of the above energy strategy. The Science Committee has oversight responsibility in two relevant areas. The committee oversees $8.5 billion of the Department of Energy's research and development funding. If we want to ensure that Americans have access to the affordable and reliable energy they need, we must strengthen DOE scientific research programs and EPA scientific integrity principles, and that is what we intend to do this Congress. As part of this process, the Science Committee expects to reauthorize the America Competes Act. A central component of that legislation is $5 billion to the Department of Energy Office of Science, which maintains world-class research facilities through the national laboratories. The office also supports innovative research that will help transform how we produce and consume energy. We will also pursue 
energy legislation that improves prioritization and management of specific programs from energy efficiency and renewable energy to nuclear, coal, oil, and natural gas. The Science Committee recently received testimony that highlighted the massive cost and duplication of federal subsidies for alternate forms of energy. The administration should not pick winners and give subsidies to favored companies that promote uncompetitive technologies. This too often leads to waste and bankruptcy as we witness with Solyndra and other companies. Instead, we should focus our resources on research and development that will produce technologies that will enable alternative energy sources to become economically competitive without the need for subsidies. Finally, we need to fix the EPA, which continues to levy numerous regulations that burden employers. Under the Obama administration, the EPA has aggressively sought to regulate nearly every aspect of the energy industry. It implements rules that burden employers and kills jobs. Insulting the taxpayers who fund the EPA, the administration refuses to release the scientific data upon which these burdensome regulations are based. This is entirely inconsistent with the President's stated commitment to lead the most open and transparent administration in history. The committee will continue to work to ensure that the EPA lives up to the President's transparency standard. The American people deserve to know all the facts, particularly since EPA's regulations on the energy sector have a direct impact on their daily lives. For example, the EPA has opposed a technological innovation that provides good paying jobs for many Americans. The fracking revolution is changing the nature of American energy production. Hundreds of communities directly benefit from the economic turnaround due to energy production made possible by the fracking technology. These locations range from North Dakota to Pennsylvania to Texas. These states' household income growth and low unemployment is a direct result of revolutionary te technology developments combined with sound energy policy and oversight at the state level. Madam Speaker, on the Science Committee, we aim to ensure that Americans reap the benefits of this current energy technology revolution, and the Science Committee will do its part. I'll yield back. Madam Speaker, could I inquire about how much time we have remaining? The gentleman has 31 minutes remaining. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. At this time, I'd like to I uh, yield to uh, my colleague from Virginia, Mr. Uh, Griffin. Thank you so much for yielding as we talk about the importance of American energy independence and using all of our fuels and all of the above. And I know that we all want to use all of the above, but there are a lot of people who want to put regulations so strict on coal that you can't use it anymore. And I hold up for you tonight the commemorative scissors that I used to cut the ribbon, along with a number of other people, at the Dominion Resources Power Plant in Virginia City, Virginia. And it wasn't 10 years ago. It wasn't five years ago. It was last September. And ladies and gentlemen, that plant would not be able to be built today if the regulations proposed by the EPA are actually adopted. Those would be the regulations relating to greenhouse gases, including carbon dioxide. Folks, when that plant was opened, they were so proud, and rightfully so. They had spent a lot of money, and they had the best technology available, the best technology available in the world. One of the cleanest plants ever opened to create electric power at a reasonable cost using the natural resources that God gave the United States of America to use our coal supply in an appropriate, efficient manner. Now, everybody says, well, coal is dirty and we shouldn't use it, but we can use it in clean ways like they're doing at the Dominion plant. But I would also point out to you that as we send jobs away, are we really making any progress? I note from one of the reports that we've gotten in the Energy and Commerce Committee that at one point in time, not too long ago, the United Mine Workers estimated that job losses with the uh, EPA target, targeting coal units due to utility mac and tighter greenhouse gas standards could cost us more than 50,000 
direct jobs in the coal, utility, and rail industries, and indirectly a figure costing us jobs of more than 250,000 uh, jobs lost. Folks, that doesn't make a lot of sense because what we're doing is, is we're making it impossible to use our coal, where we are in fact the world's largest, uh, have the largest reserves of any place in the world. We are the Saudi Arabia of coal. We don't want to use it, but many of the other nations of the world, including China, do want to use coal, and they are using coal. And what's interesting about that is, is that when you look at that, looking at a report from the Sustainable Use of Coal and Pollution Control Policy in China, dated 2009, and this was a, a group of folks looking at what they can do to continue to use coal in China. It was an international group trying to figure out what to do. They point out that in China, the fraction of power capacity with unit scale smaller than 100 megawatts is 24.8% in 2007, while it's only 7% in the U.S. in 2007. The average coal consumption per unit powered electricity supply in China is 11% higher than that of Japan. So what we're looking at is a, a situation where they're using more coal to produce the same power than we are by about 24.8% for us and 7% um, it, when it's 7%, 24.8% for them and 7% in the United States. And when you get down to the pollution, you're looking at 30% to 150% higher than that in the United States. Further, they go on to talk about the boilers related to the maximum achievable control technology in boilers. And it says normally the thermal efficiency for boilers is between 72 and 80%, which is close to the design level of developed countries. But in reality, most of the actual thermal efficiencies are between 60 to 65% which means they're 10 to 15 percent lower than the identified thermal efficiencies of boilers, which means, in effect, they're 30 to 40 percent less efficient, 30 to 50 percent less efficient than boilers in most of the developed countries. So here's what we're doing, folks. We're taking the jobs from the United States. We're sending them over to China and other countries like India and so forth. They're producing the electricity to produce the goods that we used to produce in the United States, they're doing it less efficiently, they're creating more pollution, and as a NASA study showed, it takes 10 days to get from the middle of the Gobi Desert for that air to transport across the Pacific, 10 days from the middle of the Gobi Desert in China to the eastern shore of Virginia. Folks, we have to be careful with the policies we make here. We all want clean air, we all want clean water, but we also want jobs and we have to recognize that the United States cannot solve this problem by itself. We must solve it with others working with us, and when they're not willing to start down that path and to make a good faith effort, we have to recognize that we should be as efficient as we can be, but we shouldn't be killing American jobs based on American energy when we know we can do it better and have less pollution than they can do it in other parts of the world. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. I thank my colleague for yielding back. Uh, I yield some time uh, now to our colleague from Texas, Mr. Farenthold. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to point out that affordable, American-made energy is the key to economic growth, economic development, and bringing this country out of the grips of the tough economic times that we're in. I'm blessed to represent South Texas. The district I represent covers some land that's part of the Eagle for Shale. There's a big oil and gas play going on there. You know, it's not just the uh, oil men that are doing well, it's the restaurateurs that are doing well. I've never seen so many brand new white pickup trucks, so some of this Texas oil and gas money is helping out the folks in, uh, in Detroit, General Motors, Dodge, Ford, or even some of these guys are even buying the Toyota trucks made in San Antonio, Texas. It's an economic boom where we're actually struggling to find people to work. You can go to work in a fast food restaurant for $15 an hour because they're competing with the oil and gas industry. And you know what else is happening? The low-cost natural gas that's abundantly available. They're saying a 100-year supply in Texas is creating new factories for manufacturing. In Corpus Christi alone, we've got a 
two different steel mills coming in using that gas to uh, fire their plant. We're looking at a new plastics facility coming in and numerous other industries throughout uh, the entire Texas coast and even further inland are realizing that affordable American-made energy makes the United States competitive again, even with the higher rate wages that we pay our employees than countries like China. With our low-cost energy, we can beat that. Natural gas in the United States, especially in South Texas, we're in the $4 range. If you were to buy that same natural gas and have it in uh, Japan, it's $18. We've got a huge opportunity here. We've got a huge economic advantage. You know, House Republicans, myself included, we support an all-of-the-above energy. And the technology is going to come. We're going to get the technology for wind. We're going to get the technology for solar. We're going to get the storage storage technology and batteries. All that stuff Chairman Smith was talking about that's going on with the Department of Energy and the Science and Technology Committee, those technologies are coming. But as we've seen with things like Solyndra and the tax credit that goes to uh, uh, wind farms, they're not economical today. We have low-cost fossil fuel that will bridge us until those technologies are ready for prime time and ready to go. We need to take advantage of it. We need to open up the infrastructure with things like the Keystone Pipeline. We need to open up federal land so we can charge a royalty to the oil and gas companies for producing that on federal land. That'll bring money into the federal budget that we could use for a wide variety of things, lowering the deficit, repairing our decaying infrastructure needs. We we need to be a country of yes to all of the above energy and it will solve our economic crisis and we will have a better life for every single American. Thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentleman for yielding back. Uh, at this time, we'll go to my colleague from Arkansas, Mr. Griffin. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I rise today to recognize the importance of natural gas production to America's energy security. Natural gas production is a critical part of a new economy, a new economy where energy costs are lower. In fact, there have been several articles lately that talk about manufacturing plants in Europe moving to the United States because of lower energy cost, because of the lower cost of manufacturing products using low-cost natural gas. And also, Recent studies have shown that our greenhouse gases in the United States are lower because of more natural gas use. My home state of Arkansas is an energy-rich state, and the Fayetteville Shell play has helped fuel our state's economy. It's one of the biggest deposits of natural gas in the United States. It spans approximately 4,000 square miles and is estimated to contain up to 20 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. It's considered one of the most productive shell plays in the country. But what does that mean for everyday Americans? What does it mean, what has it meant for Arkansans? Well, natural gas production is providing high paying jobs for folks in my state and my district. According to the University of Arkansas, the average annual pay in the oil and gas extraction industry was $74,000 in 2010. That's good pay. That's money that pays for food on the table, for a kid's education. That's twice the average pays of all industry in the state of Arkansas. Further, the Fayetteville Shell Place supports over 20,000 jobs. It's added $12 billion to Arkansas's economy since 2008. That impacts families. Across the country, though, you've heard some detractors these individuals have spread exaggerations, in some case falsehoods, about the environmental impacts of natural gas extraction through fracking. And I want to point out that President Obama's own U.S. Geological Survey recently produced an important report that highlights the safety of natural gas production in Arkansas. Now, you're probably not hearing a lot about it, but it's an important study that was done in conjunction with Duke University and the University of Arkansas. In, 20, in January of this year, they published a study entitled Shallow Groundwater Quality in Geochemistry in the Fayetteville Shell Gas Production Area. Well, what's the point of this study? The point of this study is that they tested groundwater and they found 
that what's going on in the Fayetteville Shell is environmentally safe. The year-long study examined the water quality of 127 shallow wells in the Fayetteville Shell, Shell Play. The report concluded there's no indication of systemic regional effects on shallow groundwater. It, this supports the understanding that natural gas production is safe for our environment and communities. And as the father of two young children, I recognize the importance of ensuring that our air is clean and that our water is clean. We must always seek to ensure that energy development is undertaken responsibly. But this report is an inconvenient truth for many out there who oppose fracking, which has given us so much natural gas and a competitive advantage. Mr. Speaker, we must support the continuation of environmentally sound natural gas production in the United States to ensure our energy independence and further decrease our reliance on foreign sources of energy. It is absolutely critical to grow our economy so that families across the country can put food on the table and pursue happiness in this great country. Thank you. With that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. I thank my